Missing five toes, well, better than missing one foot or even a whole leg. Too many people are getting life-changing amputations when better options exist. Good morning. It is Thursday, March 23rd. I'm Jessica Lovell and welcome to the morning medical update. Today we meet two patients who were able to avoid amputations thanks to a doctor dedicated to saving limbs. It's an especially important topic if you or someone you know has diabetes. Today we are focused on amputations caused by blood flow problems which go hand in hand of course with diabetes. Get this, every three minutes someone loses a limb to diabetes per the American Diabetes Association. And that's that's just in America alone, and most amputations wouldn't have to happen if patients got the right care at the right time. Alexis Del Cid shows us something as small as a blister can develop into something much, much worse. And just a slight warning, this next story does include a couple of images of open wounds. I'm a pretty much joker. <laughs> Richard Piewell is the kind of guy who can keep a sense of humor about pretty much anything, even this. I don't have toes to push down with, <laughs> so I gotta be careful when I'm climbing a ladder that I don't try to <laughs> step on the ball of my foot. <laughs> While being shuttled around to follow up doctor's appointments by his devoted wife, Carol, is not exactly his idea of a good time, or hers for that matter. After 60 years, they know how to take care of each other. They're a good team, and this is just part of the package. We bicker, but we love each other. <laughs> we have fun. He, he, he tries to get me riled up. <laughs> How's it going, guys? They also know how much worse it could have been for Richard. Well, from where we started, I don't know if you remember, they were, they were planning on cutting your whole leg off right there just below the knee. It all started when Richard, a longtime diabetic, got a blister on his foot while clearing some brush. The blister got infected and continued to get worse to the point where doctors told him they needed to amputate his leg below the knee. Limb salvage is one of my areas of interest. I'm pretty passionate about it. That's when Dr. Adam Alley, a vascular and interventional radiologist, was brought into the case to work his magic. The way we like to say it is saving limbs is saving lives. Diabetic population, people with diabetes, you can get what we call small vessel uh, arterial disease. You can get blockages in your blood vessels just like in your heart so you can get a heart attack. It was a procedure that Dr. Alley knew about but had never performed before. So they called me to see if he'd be a candidate. He, he was the first one that I had performed. What do you think? It's rather incredible. It would turn out his first one was a home run. It worked out better than our wildest dreams so that's great. It has. Like I said, I'm very fortunate I guess. The good Lord has not decided to take me in, so. <laughs> <laughs> Or his leg. Thanks. And both Dr. Adam Alley and Richard Pywell are joining us now this morning. And we're also to ha happy to have with us patient Larry Byram. Larry dealt with an issue very similar to Richard's and was also treated by Dr. Alley here. How are you doing today? Good, how are you? Good, good to see you. Richard, I wanna start with you because this all started with a blister and we all get blisters. When did you realize that your blister had turned into something more serious and that you definitely needed to get to a doctor? Well, that started, you know, when we started clearing this property to build our new home. And like I said, we just cleared a lot of brush and I got a, stepped on a hot coal. I had a pair of tennis shoes on <clears throat> and got a blister on the side on my Charco foot. And Dr. Horton is the one that actually repaired my foot. And basically from then, I just, it didn't heal properly. So when did doctors bring up the idea of amputation? Uh, that was several months after it, 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 we lost uh, uh, my little toe and it was like not getting enough blood flow to heal properly. So you had lost a toe at that point, is that correct? Yes, after, after, the, after uh, Dr. Horton had repaired the Charcot foot. So what was that like, um, getting around um, as far as balance and pain and just walking and living everyday life? Well, I basically just wore a boot, you know, a hard boot pretty much there after the procedure. And like I said, pretty much normal. I just kind of limped around. Did well, my, all these little things. 
Right, uh, yeah, but nobody likes to be limping around. It sounds like you're pretty active. Um, Dr. Ali, so help us connect the dots here. How does diabetes relate to vascular problems? We hear this a lot. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, in the diabetic population, we can get uh, what we call small vessel ischemic disease. So when you have diabetes, you have extra molecules running around in your bloodstream, and what that can do is damage the lining of the blood vessels, which can lead to scar tissue and buildup of that scar tissue over time. And the way that that works is as that scar tissue fills the vessel, it can cause a blockage. So you can think of it, if you have a garden hose and there's water running through it, and as it collects dirt or rock and sediment, the, blood, the water won't flu flow through as well. The same is true of your blood vessels. So as that stuff builds up, you'll get blockages. In the diabetic population in particular, the smaller the vessels are the ones that it tends to affect. So the most important ones are in your heart and in your head, so you can get heart attacks and strokes. Additionally, for your legs, below the knee, the blood vessels start to get very small. And once they get small, you can get blockages in your legs as well, which leads to uh, cases like uh, the ones that we have here today. Yeah, and interesting that you make the connection with the heart. Uh, the heart, the brain get blockages oh, yeah. and can die off just like other parts of our body. Um, vascular problems, and that's how they lead to amputation, right? It is exactly right, yeah. So the American Diabetes Association says most amputations are preventable, but why are they happening? Right, so the number one thing is important diabetic control. So following with your primary care physician if you have diabetes or your endocrinologist for diabetic control is invaluable to uh, helping maintain your health and maintaining a, a long life and decreasing your uh, risk for amputation and kidney disease and other things like that. And you're able to perform some procedures here at the health system to help prevent amputation, that is your passion. Um, tell us what those are. And we're seeing some uh, video uh, here. Of yes, this ab procedure. absolutely. So once you do have blockages, uh, what you're looking at is we've crossed a, a very large blockage. Um, that black dot that moving that is moving up and down is a special device that actually has a diamond on it. And it spins at 50 to 60,000 RPMs. It actually sands the plaque to help open up the vessel. And so the black image that you see flashing, that's the dye going through the vessel showing that it's now open. Uh, so it's a pretty unique uh, device that we've developed, uh, not here, but uh, we use it frequently. And it, it really works very well. And it's one of several tools that we have available to us to help open up, particularly these small vessels can be very challenging. And so that's a lot of what I do is, is once they get into those small vessels, you know, it can take some time. It can take several hours to open that stuff up from time to time. But with uh, the right tools and the right team, uh, you can get it done and, and hopefully help your patients well, out. Well, I guess, I can't imagine Larry and Richard, uh, how thrilled they were to get into your hands after hearing that, you know, they may have to have limbs amputated. So really interesting to hear these options. Larry, I want to bring you in again, another one of Dr. Ali's patients. Um, you needed to have three of your toes partially amputated. And this also started with a blister. This was back in 2018. So what led to those amputations? It was all because of a known thing called IgA vasculitis. At least that's what, uh, I believe it was Dr. Springer that actually told me. Um, he's also there at KU Med. And well, basically just uh, as treatment of that and everything that uh, came down to where I still had a blister on that uh, large toe and that large toe just started, just had a pool that uh, would not go away. And uh, eventually had me uh, moved over to sitting there looking at uh, Dr. Orr um, for wound therapy. And then he had moved me on to, uh, Dr. Orr actually moved me on to uh, Dr. Alley. And, and then before you got to Dr. Alley, tell us about what it was like when you learned that you might end up losing a leg. Well, the wound as it was and everything that uh, it just started off basically as uh, I'd walked, I mean, the secondary wound that actually appeared that uh, got Dr. Orr's attention and moved me over to Dr. Alley was basically uh, uh, three basically cuts that I got from uh, walking by a metal chair, <laughs> which actually just sprung up and turned into a scab and then just started growing from there and grew into a very ugly wound. But uh, yeah, it's uh, 
at that time and everything, Dr. Orr, before the referral and everything, was just like, uh, you might have a possible amputation there going on below the knee. Um, we'll try not to have that happen, but, uh, you know, we got uh, some good doctors here and gave a good word for Dr. Alley, and Dr. Alley gave me some very promising information. So, Dr. Alley, um, you know, the, the two incidences that led to the blisters for Richard and Larry is something that could happen to any of us, but how do we know that was diabetic related? Um, or do we? So, well, well, with Mr. Byram's case, it's actually, he, so he had a combination of arterial and venous disease. So you can get, there are different types of wounds you can get in your leg. And so some of them can be from your arteries and some of them can be from your veins. So it's important to have a comprehensive approach to figure out which one it is. They have uh, unique appearances and features. And so with Mr. Byram, uh, he had several wounds that we followed. Uh, he followed with Dr. Orr in wound care, he kept his appointments, and we were able to uh, treat both his arteries and his veins. And once we were able to do both of those things, uh, over time his wounds both on his left leg and his right leg were able to heal. Uh, in addition to that, when you open up your blood flow, as Mr. Pywell was pointing out, your amputations will heal better. So even if you are getting toe amputations, it's important to have blood flow so that your uh, amputation site will continue to heal. And, and so with Mr. Byram, we were fortunate that we were able to uh, diagnose both of those situations. Um, he did have arterial work and venous work done, all part of the cardiovascular system, and um, he had a wonderful result. Uh, it, we're really very pleased with the way that turned out. All right, Larry, we're gonna take a look at this, this foot and this leg. Um, it just, everyone, this is a little bit of a show and tell, a little graphic, so just be aware if you wanna turn away for just a moment. Um, but it really gives us an idea of what, what you were looking at, Dr. Ali, when you, when you saw Larry and his toe blister first. So let's take a look, if you can, here at the monitor and tell us, um, kind of tell us the flow of how everything. Yeah, so transpired. when you get a, so as I was just speaking about, when you get, there are different types of wounds. When you tend to get them in your toes and they have, it looks like a punched out lesion, mm -hmm. they tend to be arterial. Um, there's lack of blood flow from the artery, which causes that. This next one on the shin was uh, probably a combination. So if you get one on the shin that's shallow and it's got irregular borders and it tends to be red around it, they can tend to be venous. And that was on the other leg, so. Yeah, so, correct. The, correct. So uh, he ended up, so Mr. Byram had wounds on both of uh, his shins. Uh, this one, because it's round, uh, and we know from his arterial studies that he had arterial insufficiency, uh, the primary importance for us was to restore blood flow to his artery. Uh, for his uh, initially, before we treated the veins. But then it got bigger. So let's see. So yeah, so then this is the other leg again. So this is a, a different wound. So this one's shallow, irregular. It's on the shin. Uh, it had a large uh, arterial and venous component. So we treated both of his, his artery to restore flow and his veins, his venous insufficiency. Um, below his leg here with a special medical glue. Um, and once we were able to restore flow to the artery and uh, treat his veins, um, we can see the result. And it was a, it was a pretty dramatic result. And so I think good. we have the before and afters. Yeah, there it is. So yeah, so, uh, so once we were able to treat his veins, treat his artery, and he had his uh, appropriate surgical uh, treatment, it really was a great result. And um, the, the biggest thing I'd like to emphasize is that when you when you have wounds like this, it's important that if you ever run a fever or you feel like they're getting infected that can spread to your body to please uh, seek medical attention immediately because th th those need to be treated uh, ASAP. And what yeah. you're saying is that had you not have seen him, that they may have had to take his leg off. Oh yeah, definitely. So the, w w without treatment of the underlying causes, the issues causing those ulcers are the reason that they show up. If, if without appropriate treatment, uh, they'll recur. They, they just won't get better. So yeah. we, we looked at the outside. Let's take a look inside. Show us what you're doing to make Larry yeah, better. So these are the arteries. Mm -hmm. And so a good example is this picture on that side. Okay. The black is dye. So as it runs through the vessel, you can see it, which is open. Okay. Where it's white, there's a blockage because the dye can't get through. In his particular case, we used some advanced techniques where we got into a small vessel into the foot and we came from above from his hip 
And this is the before picture and then there's the after picture there. You can see there's restoration of flow uh, to that blood vessel. So hopefully you can get uh, blood to the area of the wound and, and help it heal. And this case turned out exactly the way you wanted it? About as good as it can get? It was, yes, uh, it was uh, a pretty good result. So we were very satisfied so, with it. So Larry, we know that you could see the results, but did you feel different once you restored that blood flow? Oh yeah, it was night and day. Um, the pain that the wound was actually causing was actually quite extravagant. Um, it was on um, some days unbearable. Um, just uh, as the wound started healing and everything, it just started, the pain just started going away. And it's like, that was the, the best thing I had. And so how, how have things changed for you? Have you adapted to, to losing the toes? And um, are, you, are you staying active as I know you want to? Well, unlike Richard, he had the, all of his toes um, taken off and uh, I just had the three partials. The three partials were basically, you know, the large toe, of course, on the, the, the tips of the remaining two uh, interior toes. But uh, it's gotten better. Um, I'm still actually relearning how to walk properly, as I would call it from years ago, um, prior to the window uh, appearing there. So yeah, it's, it's, I've, I've gotten much better. Quality of life is much better. And that's what we like to hear. Dr. Ali, how serious is an amputation to a person's overall health? A, a, a minor amputation, I don't like to use that word, but as opposed to having an entire leg taken off a toe, but talk us through uh, losing a limb, like a leg, and then losing even the smaller uh, pieces, like, yeah, like a toe. It's a great question. So we do, we do categorize um, limb amputations as minor and major. Mm -hmm. So a major amputation is defined as an amputation above the ankle. So we know in the diabetic population that once you start getting major amputations or amputations above the ankle, uh, your mortality rate actually goes down. So that's why we say saving limbs is saving lives. So if you can prevent major amputations, um, it can, what we know is that it should help with your life expectancy and help you live longer. So. And what about for folks like Larry who have, have to relearn to walk? I mean, we know his quality of life is so much better because of the pain, but um, you know, what do you hear from patients as far as just trying to regain those new skills? Oh yeah, they, um, so with, they're usually very happy that they, uh, that they didn't have their leg amputated. Um, it does take a little time and a little work. Uh, they usually get back to hopefully, you know, their regular daily activities and they're enjoying life. Um, but yeah, it, uh, it, it's certainly a result that, uh, that we should hope for. Uh, so I, I have to ask you, Richard, I want to bring you back in here. What was it like when you first met Dr. Alley? Uh, well, like I said, I was in the hospital. I was uh, with my toes being chopped off or cut off. And like I said, it was just uh, something that we w wanted to try to save my leg. So, like I said, you know, I still feel very active, and like I said, I still do a lot of climbing on ladders and scaffolding and restoring vehicles and cars and motors. <laughs> I'm just, you know, I'm active in my shop about every day. So, life's yeah. uh, good. And like I said, shorter my, time. So like, I take a lot of naps, so that I shouldn't do. Hey, who doesn't? Hey, get him in while you can. I appreciate that. So, but I like that you were able to communicate. He was able to communicate with you what, you know, what he needs to get back to doing. And, and then you, you get to see this result. Uh, same question uh, to you, Larry. What was it like uh, that first meeting with Dr. Alley? I was kind of skeptical at the point because it uh, was kind of a traumatic to hear the news of uh, wanting to take my leg off, or at least below the knee. And I was like, that was just unheard of because I've been was in the military for, you know, a couple of, you know, 10, 12 years. Um, I used to walking a lot and I'd always walked every, almost every run in my life. So it's like just being able to keep that uh, in my life and everything was a great godsend. So godsend I'm very happy for, for sure. Dr. Alley's uh, introduction. Good. We're so glad you found him. Uh, make sure you get your questions sent into all of our guests if you have questions for them. You can go to YouTube, Facebook, and the Medical News Network. You can find links to those right there on your screen. Let's get a quick check on our COVID count. Dr. Dana Hawkinson is in, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control. Good morning. How are you? Hi. Doing really hey, well. Hey. Good. Yeah. Right now, uh, cases are still low, so 37 active. Or sorry, 37 total, 24 active, five in the ICU, one less than yesterday, um, but still one on the ventilator. So. Okay.
got to get yes. your thoughts on this one. So yes. a new study is proving that social media influencers are not great sources of medical advice, mm -hmm. right? Never, I, that's never, true. never heard yeah. of that before, yeah. um, especially when it comes to prescription drugs. So in the Journal of Medical Internet Research, researchers interviewed 26 so-called patient influencers. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're paid by pharmaceutical companies to share their stories online. And Hawk, um, a little bit of a gray area here yeah. because on one hand, we like it when people are open and free and share their medical mm -hmm. journeys. But on the other hand, when you're getting paid to do it, it raises ethical questions about the transparency involved. What are your yeah. thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely true. And we know that, um, you know, here at the health system or University of Kansas Medical Center, whenever we're giving talks, we are disclosing if we've received any funds or any money or are on any speaking boards or consultant firms for any, or consultants for any uh, pharmacologic or research firms. You know, I don't think this always happens with social media. And I don't know that, you know, today's younger generations growing up, just seeing a TikTok is gonna understand that. I think that's okay if you give a testimonial, if you are paid, but I, you really need to disclose that. And second of all, you know, that first point just about um, general people or social media influencers giving medical advice and things of that nature, I think that's very dangerous. And we've tried to hit out against that misinformation overall since the pandemic began, and it's probably just going to continue to increase. But um, for this, um, this story essentially, yeah, it is concerning. And I think if you are giving a uh, testimonial and if you are paid by pharmaceutical companies or research companies, I think that's fine. It's just you have to disclose that to the people um, or on your, on your site or on your uh, TikTok, um, you know, post or whatever that might be. As long as there is disclosure about that and there is transparency, that is what is important. Well, and as we sit here on Facebook today, you're kind of the only uh, influencer that we trust around here on social media. Well, and I think, you don't get paid I, I, to come down here every day, by the way, I <laughs> full disclosure there. No, I think Dr. Stites is as well, yeah. you know, certainly. Um, but yeah, I, I think that is vitally important. And, you know, certainly when I give talks uh, around the state or in the region or for any uh, anything else, even in-house talks, um, we are obligated to s disclose our, um, our, have financial disclosures, just so that everybody knows that everything is transparent. And, and that's, again, that's okay if you are, you just have to disclose that. And that doesn't always happen here, right. for sure. But good to know. I don't think people scrolling through always know that piece of information. So good, good tip yeah, there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, any reporters with us today? Let's get to our viewer questions. And this is um, from Tina, and she wants to know, Richard or Larry, do you ever feel phantom pain or itching? Uh, well, I kind of feel like my toes are cold, but they're not because they're not there. <laughs> That's so interesting, uh, Larry. Yeah, I feel it when I'm walking sometimes. It uh, just has a random feeling sometimes. It's like, why shouldn't be feeling that? There's no toes there. <laughs> or yeah, that, that part of the toe's not there. Dr. Ali, that's so interesting. Explain it to us. What is the phantom pain all about? Yeah, so you can, uh, so when you've had an amputation, you can get something called phantom limb pain. And so it's essentially a neuropathy. So your nerve, uh, where it's going, um, can trick your brain uh, into thinking that what has been amputated uh, is, is hurting. So it's, it's something we're familiar with. Um, and it, it, it's part of the process. This is an yep. interesting phenomenon. So Toby wants to know, also Richard and Larry, um, have you changed anything in your lifestyle since your amputation? Just uh, the way you live, the way you move or eat or anything? Uh, not really, I said I've Slow really down. a pretty active life. I said when you get to be 83 years old, you move a lot slower than you used to. But like I said, I still you know enjoy working in my shop, welding and building things. And Kelly like said, we're restoring some <clears throat> old buildings on our property. So like I said, I'm still uh, very active and, and enjoy yes, <laughs> life. <laughs> Larry, what about you? Well, um, I actually have a hobby job that I actually do and everything. I'm actually a motorcycle instructor, so I'm on my feet. Last year, basically, because the wound is still fresh in my, you know, repertoire here, um, that basically didn't finish healing until almost like what September, I think it was the last month. Um, 
towards the end of the season. So I look forward to this season being able to sit there and actually go out and do some riding and actually be able to teach people how to ride motorcycles again. Fantastic. Uh, Camilla wants to know if I don't have, have diabetes, am I still at risk? So you are still at risk for peripheral arterial disease. Okay. So getting blockages in your blood vessels, diabetes is one reason you can have it. Uh, there are other reasons to get blockages in your blood vessels, such as high cholesterol, uh, high blood pressure, things like that, smoking. Um, so it is what we always recommend is that you keep your regular uh, doctor appointments. Um, your overall health and your general health is paramount. You keep your checks with your blood work and things of that nature. And that way, the earlier we can get to it, the, the better off it'll be, uh, should you have those risk factors and uh, managing them that way is, is really what we emphasize as a primary importance uh, for all of our patients. Okay, a couple of combo questions from Ruth Allen and Vera, but how does one make an appointment with your clinic? And let me get back up here to Ruth. Um, she just wants to know how our patients got in touch with you. So how does all that work as far as being referred? Uh, well, these two particular patients came from other physicians. If you would like to make an appointment in our vascular clinic with me, there is the Center for Advanced Vascular Care at KU. Uh, it should be available directly on the website. Uh, you just go there, there should be a phone number. Just call it and we can set you up. All right, and last question's from Jeremy. What What is, uh, you said you're most passionate about this. What, what's the most exciting part of your job? Uh, well, the most exciting part of my job is seeing how much, when, when our patients come back and as Mr. Byron was saying, when their pain is resolved and they feel better, uh, that is the most exciting part. It's not the actual procedure, it's the follow-up. So when you see them, they're doing better, they've kept their follow-ups, their appointments, um, and they're smiling again is, yeah. is, is definitely the best part. Good so. to see these guys out with their motorcycles and back out in their yeah. shop and welding and doing all those you good bet. things. All right, let's wrap this program up today. Let's get today's takeaway. Dr. Alley, I'll start with you. Uh, so what I would like to emphasize for everyone is what, what we were just talking about. So when you do have those conditions, you're not going to feel the pain until it's too late. So diabetes, high blood pressure, they'll cause blockages and you won't feel anything and it's not until the blockage is complete that you start having the pain. So I, I really do emphasize uh, preventative medicine, so keeping your regular appointments with your doctor and general health care getting the appropriate screening exams, vaccines, everything of that nature uh, is what I'd really like to drive home to everyone. All right, Larry, your takeaway today, what do you want folks to know? I would say exactly the same thing as Dr. Ali said, except from a patient point of view. Uh, he is, uh, his compassion and uh, drive to sit there and actually uh, go from beginning to actually understand what's actually going on to re resolution is fantastic. All right, Richard, your takeaway, what do you want us to know today? Well, like, like he said, you know, I just follow up with the, you know, what your doctors recommend, like I said, and try to live a good, healthy lifestyle. And, and like I said, just be active and keep active and keep smiling, and keep smiling as my wife says. And my <laughs> daughters all have a great family life. Our daughters all, uh, you know, enjoy coming out and visiting and help us every chance they get. So. Like I said, uh, life's good and I enjoy it. Gentlemen, thank you so much for sharing your stories with us today. We always appreciate you. Uh, Dr. Hawkinson, take away today. Yeah, I mean, you know, diabetes uh, is such a, a um, predominant disease here in the United States. It's very important to keep your blood sugars low, continue to have good feet health, do those feet checks, make sure there's no wounds, talk with your medical team. And then on the topic of uh, social influencers, remember that is uh, that can be very dangerous and there's a lot of misinformation going on. Please pick your sources for your medical advice very carefully. Certainly we've always espoused that here on this show and with Dr. Stites looking at sites like uh, local and state health departments, the CDC, the FDA, things of that nature. Just be careful out there because there is a lot of misinformation. All right, All Things Heart is coming up at 10. Here's Alexis Del Cid with a preview. Good morning. Good morning, Jess. We have a wonderful story for you this morning. It's about a woman named Tony who truly felt like she'd lost her life because of chronic pain. The pain thing can be like a cycle where you feel the, you anticipate the pain coming, so you stress up or you tighten up and then the pain comes and it's worse.
To make it even worse than that, doctors say there's a strong connection between chronic pain and heart troubles. So that's awful. But this is why the story you're about to see about Tony is so wonderful. She found a physical therapist here at the health system who also runs a special clinic to help people with chronic pain. And Tony says that gave her her life back. So we're going to explore that link we talked about between chronic pain and the heart. And we'll also talk about the pain clinic that helped Tony. That's all coming up this morning on All Things Heart at 10 a.m. So bring your questions. All right, Alexis, we'll see you then. Thank you to all of our guests and our viewers today. Have a great one coming up tomorrow. The new government rule for mammograms. Doctors need to tell women if they have dense breasts, a discussion that will empower women who live with this condition and might not even know about it. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stein's podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.